Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we will be discussing on pulse oximetry. Beer Lambert Law If the transmittance of light is measured, then the following equations are expressed in exponentials. As there is an exponential decline in the quantity of light remaining as it passes through an absorbing substance. If absorbance of light is measured, then the following equations are expressed as linear relationships. And linear relationships are easier to explain in an examination setting. Beer's law states that the absorbance of light passing through a medium is proportional to the concentration of the medium and its molar extinction coefficient. Lambert's law states that the absorbance of light passing through a medium is proportional to the path length. Beer-Lambert law states that A equals epsilon LC, where A is the absorbance of light, epsilon is the molar extinction coefficient, L is the path length, and C the concentration. The concentration and molar extinction coefficient are constant in the pulse oximeter, and the only variable is the path length which changes as arterial blood expands the vessel in a pulsatile manner. The Principles of Pulse Oximetry Pulse oximetry is a non-invasive measurement of arterial blood oxygen saturation at the level of the arterioles and enables the early detection of arterial hypoxemia and treatment initiation prior to tissue damage. The components of a pulse oximeter consist of a probe, which has two light-emitting diodes and a photodetector, a microprocessor and a display. This is a graph of the hemoglobin absorption spectra. At a wavelength of 660 nanometers, oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs less light than deoxygenated hemoglobin. At 800 nanometers wavelength, the absorption coefficients are identical for oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, and this is known as the isobestic point. At a wavelength of 940 nanometers, oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more light than deoxygenated hemoglobin. The pulse oximeter probe has two light-emitting diodes and it emits pulses of red at 660 nanometers and infrared at 940 nanometers light every 5 to 10 microseconds from one side of the probe. The repetitive LED sequence for the two diodes are on-off, off-on and off-off. The off off part allows baseline measurement for changes in ambient lighting. The high frequency of the LEDs allow the absorbance of light to be sampled many times each second during each pulse and averages of oxygen saturation can be calculated. This reduces the noise effect on the signal, for example, from physical movement. The light is transmitted through the tissue and sensed by a photodetector on the other side of the body part that is measured, such as the finger, earlobe, toe or nose. The amount of light absorbed is based on the Beer-Lambert law. As the vessels in the finger expand and contract with each pulse, they alter the amount of light that is absorbed at each wavelength, resulting in two waveforms to be produced by the sensor. If there is an excess of deoxyhemoglobin, more red than infrared light will be absorbed, the amplitude of the red waveform will be smaller, and if there is an excess of oxyhemoglobin, more infrared than red light will be absorbed, and the amplitude of the infrared waveform will be smaller. The ratios of these amplitudes allow the microprocessor to give an estimate of the SpO2 
by comparing the values with those stored in its memory. The voltage generated by the photodetector is proportional to the amount of light absorbed. The output then undergoes electronic processing, during which the absorption of the blood at 660 nanometers and 940 nanometers wavelengths is converted to a ratio known as the R to IR ratio, which is compared to an algorithm produced from experimental data. It measures the platysmographic oxygen saturation rather than the arterial oxygen saturation. As light is absorbed by non-pulsatile tissue is constant, whereas it is non-constant by pulsatile tissues, the non-constant absorption component of the wave is 1-5% to of the total signal, and pulse oximetry measures the pulsatile component and subtracts the non-pulsatile constant component before displaying a pulse waveform and the percentage oxygen saturation. More recent designs use more than 7 light wavelengths to enable the measurement of hemoglobin value, oxygen content, carboxyhemoglobin, and myth hemoglobin concentrations. The rationale for the use of pulse oximetry Cyanosis as a clinical indicator for hypoxia is unreliable. Experimental studies show that 25% of observers were unable to detect cyanosis at oxygen saturations as low as 75% among volunteers breathing various hypoxic mixtures. 10-15% to of observers claim that cyanosis is present at saturations of greater than 91%. The detection of cyanosis is confounded by various factors such as ambient light, skin pigmentation, and more than 50 grams per liter of deoxygenated hemoglobin has to be present in the capillary bed for generation of clinical cyanosis. Thus, anemic patients may not demonstrate cyanosis at all. Limitations and sources of error for pulse oximetry. Accuracy of pulse oximetry is up to plus minus 2% in a range of 70 to 100%, but readings below 70% is extrapolated. As pulse oximetry is calibrated against healthy volunteers from 100% down to 70%, and Saturations below 70% is not conducted in healthy volunteers as it is dangerous and unethical. Interference by ambient light. This occurs if the light is bright and direct and compensation for ambient light occurs to a certain extent due to the pulse nature of the probe light. Loss of the pulsatile component results in less accurate SpO2 measurements as the AC component is reduced, such as in hypothermia, hypoperfusion, venous congestion, narrow pulse pressure, arrhythmia, which distorts the point of maximum and minimum absorption, venous congestion, and the use of arterial tonicae and BP cuffs, which causes hypoperfusion as well. Movement artifact or electrical interference can interfere with the accuracy of SpO2 measurements. Infrared absorption by other substances such as nail varnish or nicotine staining can affect the accuracy of SpO2. More significant errors are associated with absorption by abnormal hemoglobins and other compounds. Falsely low SpO2 can result in the presence of Jaundice, bilirubin has a similar absorption coefficient to deoxygenated hemoglobin and this will give an abnormally low saturation reading. In the presence of methemoglobinemia, this will result in falsely low SpO2 as methemoglobin has absorption spectra similar to deoxygenated hemoglobin at both wavelengths 
and this gives a saturation reading of around 84%. In the presence of dyes such as methylene blue, disulfine blue, indocyanin green and nail varnish, falsely low readings will occur. In the presence of carboxyhemoglobinemia, this will give an abnormally high SpO2 reading of about 96% as carboxyhemoglobin has a similar absorption coefficient to oxygenated hemoglobin. There will be no significant clinical change in the presence of HBF, sulfur HB and dark skin pigmentation. Inaccurate measurements can be caused by venous pulsations which can be due to high airway pressures, the Valsava maneuver, and conditions which cause impaired venous return. Pressure sores and burns can occur at the site of application of the SpO2 probe, especially in infants and at body parts of poor perfusion, and it is recommended to rotate the site of the probe every two hours. Problems in interpretation the pulse oximeter does not detect respiratory failure. It does not detect a rising PaCO2. The absolute measurement of oxygen saturation varies from one probe to another, but with accurate trends as the center wavelength of LED are variable between different probes. There is a lag of 20 seconds or more between any drop in arterial oxygen tension due to the slope of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. The response time to desaturation can be delayed depending on the location of the probe. It can be more than 60 seconds for a finger probe and 10 to 15 seconds for a ear probe. In very anemic patients, SpO2 readings may show high saturations, although oxygen delivery to the tissues may be impaired. The amplitude of the pulse waveform does not give an accurate measurement of the pulse volume, as many instruments automatically augment the trace to fill the display. Were the anesthetist were to be restricted to a single monitor, the most useful would be a device that can reliably measure the state of cerebral oxygenation, such as near-infrared spectroscopy. To estimate PaO2 from SpO2, this is a general guide. With a range of SpO2 from 90 to 100%, every 1% drop of SpO2 equates to 4 mmHg drop in PaO2. From a SpO2 range of 80 to 90%, every 1% drop in SpO2 equates to approximately 1.5 mmHg drop in PaO2. And for SpO2s less than 80%, an estimation of the PaO2 will be to divide the SpO2 by 2. These are my references. Thank you.